and sticky can really change life for us, but this takes uh, place right in the midst of it. And this essay is called Spawning in Mud. Lori came home from lunch. Her clothes were soaked and she needed to change, but she put that off. Come on, she said, let's go look at the river. I was wearing shorts. I felt lethargic, spinny from too much caffeine, guilty for not working on the woodshed. Why? I asked. The water's getting pretty high, she said. It might flood. Flood? I thought she had lost her mind. All summer, the threat of a catastrophic wildfire had cast a pall over the valley. Ferns browned up and bowed over, twigs snapped under soles, and we winced. I'd spent so much dread on wildfires that I'd forgotten completely about floods. Besides, after that 100-year flood eight years back, didn't we have a 92-year hiatus coming? <laughs> Come on, she said. She pointed to my boots in the corner where I'd left them after my last day of trails. I pulled them on and we headed out. As we neared the river, the puddles began moving in rivulets that divided and spread like a crowd racing for their cars after a ball game. We stood on the bank with our camera and waved at school kids standing on the opposite bank. Lori jumped up and down, and the kids mimicked her. I stood still. The air buzzed and roared with excitement, but I resisted. As a seasonal laborer on the backcountry trail cruise, I would have been free to give in to it. We cheered when trail bridges washed away. If it meant more work for us, that was fine. The river not only had more might than us, we figured, but more right, too. Once, when I worked in Canyonlands, a visitor had knocked on my door in the middle of the night to tell me about a rattlesnake she'd seen in the backcountry. Someone should do something about it, she said. <laughs> <laughs> the park belongs to the rattlesnakes, I said. And I shut the door. For many years, I believed something similar about floods. The valley belongs to the river. The difference was that now that we'd settled down and bought land and built a home, we belonged to the valley too. On our way back home, a familiar pickup slowed next to us. I think it's going to get wild, the driver said. After he drove off, we walked in silence. If we were a little late catching the hint, we did have an excuse. Experts had explained November floods to us this way. Snow comes too early and then melts too fast when the freezing level rises and rain sets in. There's a name for that, a rain on snow event. This time, there was precious little snow in the mountains and the rain had only begun the night before. I'd even checked the website mid-morning, only 6,000 CFS. The fact that the pickup driver, who had lived his whole life in Stahik and didn't need expert analysis or internet numbers to recognize a flood, said it was going to get wild was sobering. We climbed the bank, 20 feet or so to the slightly higher ground where we built our cabin, a wise decision that now seemed, and we went inside to begin to fill water bottles, thermoses, the bathtub, preparing for the inevitable power outage. The river continued to rise. At dusk, we ventured out one last time. I still wore shorts, and the fact that it was summer clothes warm did not seem like a good omen. The water had already reached the bottom log of a vacation home across the road that sits on a three-foot-high foundation. By now, it seemed less like a river than the ocean. Swells formed and curled over amongst the trees. A charging, persistent roar grew louder, more sea-like by the minute. With all the displaced fish, would-be spawning salmon now adrift in the foam, it even smelled like the ocean. Stahik and salmon are not what you would think. They're not mighty ocean farers, but smaller, wiry, landlocked sockeyes called kokanees, who make a comparatively short trip from the lake upstream to lay eggs. Through most of September and October, while portaging our inflatable kayak through the shallows, Lori and I, as a rule, try not to stir up too much mud in the shallows of the river, try to give them a little personal space. But this was late October, which is pretty late in their game. These hangers-on had apparently hung on just for this one last wild ride. They did not stand a chance. So the flood smelled like the ocean, and, Lori noted, like a lumber mill. She was right. All those logs, roots, and limbs, freshly torn, needles dangling, careening past or jamming up, straining in the current, then breaking loose cannon shot, they could have built a thousand homes. Back at home, the power went out, so we sat in the dark, the room flickering orange from the wood stove fire, and we listened to the handheld radio. Some people still had power, and they were watching the numbers <coughs> on the internet. 
Up to 12,000, they reported. 20,000, Larry said. I'll bet it's as big as 96. No way, I said. 16.5 max. This is not so bad, I thought. Everyone is overreacting. We went to sleep listening to the roar. In the morning when the highest high water seemed to have passed, we made drip coffee one cup at a very slow time on a single burner backpacker stove before stepping out to check on a couple of our <coughs> 60s part-time residents who had likely never seen such an event and who may not have thought to move to higher ground. They can't be at home, I argued. They wouldn't have stayed. Lori ignored me and charged ahead through the sopping brush. From a distance, we saw a whiff of smoke. Ahoy, mates, the neighbors called. The couple stood on their top step barefoot, checking out the mud streak level on the side of the cabin. The river had been a quarter inch from barging in. They had been isolated a quarter mile from anyone without even a radio. Nevertheless, they were in great spirits. They posed for photos and wandered out in the muck. I was impressed. These folks were used to risk. The barefoot man had spent years flying hang gliders and once survived a hot air balloon crash. His wife frequently traveled alone in South America. No one was going to get too wound up about this. The attitude at first was astonishingly nonchalant. Oh, that. Back at the house, people began to trickle in, the intrepid out to survey the damage, others trying to get home after having bailed out. We served coffee and apple quarters and peanut butter, anything that did not require cooking or opening the refrigerator since the power was off and likely to stay that way. The damage was hard to assess because the water still ran down the road, as far as anyone could see, and in many places braided out through the woods. The silt in many places had the consistency of pudding. Many homes had taken in water, and one house, the postmasters, had been completely lost. Last anyone saw, it sat teetering over the froth, splintering slowly away. Friends came and went, dishes piled up, the sun broke through clouds, steam rose, and like an undercurrent, the blaming began. We should have dredged the channel years ago, some people said. We should have hardened the banks. If only the river hadn't been dredged in the 70s, others said. If only people hadn't built where they did. I tried to steer clear. I wondered, is it possible that no matter what we did or didn't do, we would face this? I didn't dare say so. Some people just needed to vent. They needed to feel that someone had done something wrong and that there was something someone should do to make it right. I'll stop there. <laughs>